This is Michael Krasny welcoming you to another episode of the Gray Matter with Michael Krasny podcast. Today's episode features internationally acclaimed, award-winning photographer Howard Schatz, author of 23 books, including the most recent pairs, which we'll find out about in the course of this conversation. His work has been featured in over 100 museum and gallery exhibitions throughout the world, known especially for his photos of dance and dancers, professional athletes and professional athletics, and actors and acting, as well as his landmark work in underwater photography. He's also worked in the private sector with a host of major companies, including Nike, Reebok, Sony, Adidas, MGM Grand Hotel, Virgin Records, and Mercedes-Benz. His weekly journal, On Seeing, is available for free online at howardshots.com. And I need to add that Prior to his stellar career as a photographer, he was a preeminent ophthalmologist with a specialization in retina diseases, especially macular degeneration. It can be challenging to discuss visual imagery, but I know many of you who are listening to us live are serious amateur photographers with questions about the art and science, as well as the mechanics of photography. So I remind you that we do welcome your questions and comments, and I welcome Dr. Howard Schatz. Good to have you. Thanks, Michael. Nice to see you. Good to see you and good to be seen. And uh, virtually every photographic award is under this man's belt. Uh, congratulations on the new book, Pairs, which Thanks. has 365 images in it. And after 30 years as a professional photographer, he now has, I think, more photography books than he did have ophthalmology books. Uh, it's been an amazing career, an amazing range in terms of the body of work. I thought we'd begin, though, by talking about something that I've always been interested in talking to you about. And if people want to see your work, they can just go to howardshots.com, even while we're talking here. And that is where creativity comes from. What sparks it? What ignites it? What stokes it? Uh, it's been something I know that you've reflected a lot about. So have I. So let's hear what you have to say about it. I mean, the creative process, you've said it's infinite. I know that. And you've said it's like branches of a tree. Each branch is different, and you don't know where it's going and so forth, but let's reflect on it. Creativity, there are a lot of definitions, and I'll come up with a few. One is, it's the development of something that never existed before. And what's more fun than that? There's a hidden world. There's an unseen world of infinite possibilities visually, through writing, music, sculpture, all sorts of things that is waiting to be found and discovered. And the process of working openly to look and find things that haven't been seen before, that are also wonderful, is play. Um, creativity is a sort of play uh, and childlike. The older we get and the more we develop norms of behavior and thinking and being, the more restricted we come in terms of the ability to play. And what's wonderful for me is that I've, over 30 years, I've learned and continue to learn that by leaving myself open to my intuition, to what the world is offering me, and uh, looking for that which is previously unseen, is as a fun kind of play that I could ever imagine. I photograph to surprise and delight myself, and I do it by being open. So your openness and your delight in what you do, and passion, by the way, I think plays an important role in the work that you do, has covered so many different territories. I mean, I have to ask you, at this stage of your life and your career, what stands out as being perhaps most rare, most precious, or is there anything that stands out and continues to endure in that way? I am as hungry as ever. I, the world every day offers th things to try out. Oh, I, I do a number of things. When I see something in the street, I'll take an iPhone picture of it for my files. I have a file of what I call um, ideas. They're little tiny JPEGs, and there are thousands and thousands, and I've categorized them into all sorts of categories, and I go to them all the time. I just photographed a dancer. Uh, well, actually, I had four 
different shoots in the last few days and I'm starting to edit the work and I worked on one image of a dancer thinking of ideas and I went back to my ideas just for other inspirations and I wanted to try things. I had never tried this. I had never tried that. See what works. And having experience and taste is very important because you can try things that are different and new, but they're ugly and don't work. So it's a, it's a process of discovery and play. And um, it's mostly, it's mostly fun. Whereas like in medicine in medicine, the big difference between medicine and art, I mean, you can list a whole different bunch of things and lots have been written about it, but the biggest difference is consequence. In medicine, you can't just try stuff. There are consequences. People can suffer, but in art, there are no mistakes. Anything that didn't work is a learning experience. Anything you try out that ah, didn't work, you learn something from it. So it's a limitless play. And, um, and I don't know that I can answer your question, that I have one interest more than the well, other. Well, do you play differently, was, though? For example, I mean, you've, you've shot homeless people. You shot uh, Fol Folsom Street Fair where people dress in ways that are unimaginable, you know, to sort of in an exhibitionistic way show off their often aberrations sexually or whatever they may choose to call them or characterize them. In other words, are you doing a shoot for Ralph Lauren images and so forth? takes on, it would seem to me, a different persona for you as a photographer, depending on what you're photographing. Well, well that's true. Let, let's just, just uh, for a second talk about um, photographing for me versus photographing for somebody else. Commercial photography, there's an art director and a company that wants a certain thing, and as a photographer... The photographer has to read the mind as best they can, giving all sorts of examples, and then uh, with challenges of the physical world, attempt to make the image that those people want. If one tries to make art with an audience in mind, it screws up the art. One has to work for oneself. One has to work for one's own happiness. One has to work for making something for their own being and their own satisfaction. And they cannot think of the consequence of other eyes. So that's fine. Even when you have a paymaster? I mean, and you have to please that paymaster? <laughs> well, yeah. so I don't really enjoy or very, do very much commercial work. I really don't want to do that. It pays great money and the commercial work sort of feeds my addiction and obsession to making my own work. But I'm at a point in life where I don't really need to do that. And my fine art work sells in galleries and sufficiently supports my need to look for myself. So I photograph for me now in terms of subject matter, you sometimes it runs its course. I photograph the Folsom street fair every Saturday the last every Saturday, uh, in the, the last Saturday of every year for twenty years, and I I didn't see everything obviously, but I saw ninety nine percent of everything, and so I you know I move on. Same thing for underwater. I haven't taken an underwater picture in three four years. I feel like I've really explored that field, and don't feel that there's more for me particularly to explore and see. But there are other areas that interest me. Homeless. I went out into the streets of San Francisco every Saturday for a year, photographing and interviewing 20 people for a year. That's a thousand people. That's a body of work. And I, when we did the edit, I remember Owen Edwards saying, how many bearded old white men do you need in this book? We try to edit down a thousand pictures down to 50 for the book. And so it's true. You sort of run the gamut of interest and then move on. But, but I am as hungry as ever to keep seeing new things and discovering new things. Well, there is something that uh, amounts to a kind of motif in your work. You've always been fascinated with the human body. I mean, in so many different forms. I mean, whether it's athletes and capturing the athlete's physique and the way they look 
uh, facial expressions. Uh, it's also pregnant women, uh, babies, newborns, and so forth. Uh, this sense of fascination I can see in your work, maybe it goes back to anatomy classes in medical school or something along those lines, but it is definitely a, something that unifies a lot of your work. It does. Um, I'm very interested in the human form. Uh, one part of it is biologic sculpture. I began to photograph the end of pregnancy, 38, 39, 40 weeks of pregnancy, because of the form. And that's where body knots came from, because that's another kind of biologic sculpture. We should mention for um, uh, body knots is, uh, I should give a, a quick description. It's bodies in knots, really. I mean, people posing uh, most of the models, I presume, uh, getting their body into different kind of knots and you taking the photographs. Yeah, dancers, usually two dancers, come together in, in ways where they're not identified, but their bodies are entangled. I use a wide-angle lens. I colored it later. I, I made things that surprised and delighted me. But I'm interested in all the body in every sort of way. I mean, yeah, I'm working on a project on the NFL now. And what's really interesting to me is so the National nature Football and nurture. League for those who may not be acquainted with those initials. Sorry, that's right. For example, offensive linemen are generally three hundred to three hundred fifty pounds, big, huge guys that do two things. One, they create a wall of protection for the quarterback so he can pass, or they create a gap in the defensive line in order that a runner can pass through. These are big, huge people. Now, take the opposite end of it. Take a cornerback who might be 180 pounds, who can run sideways and backwards as almost as fast as he can run forwards. They're like little gymnasts. And so looking at NFL players, there's a whole range of body type from slim and quick to bulky and thick to totally muscular to tall and lean. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating, quite interesting, and that's one of my interests. And um, I haven't lost my interest in the human form. Well, there's interest in finding out information from you. I want to go to a question from a listener right now who's joining us from Provo, Utah. It's Fred, and thank you for the question, Fred. And again, questions are welcome. Uh, Fred wants to know, while it's not about tools, what cameras, lenses, and lights are you using right now? <laughs> well, you know, um, anything that works for you, uh, anything that makes images for you, it sort of doesn't matter. But if you need to know what I use in my studio, I, as a studio photographer, I use strobes and medium format cameras. I use a Hasselblad camera, bronze color strobes, Chimera lightings, and I find that I have a phenomenal range of possibilities to see things, to light things. Um, I walk, I where when I'm outside of my, where we live, I carry a camera all the time. Michael Krasny and I have gone for walks on Tiburon's uh, walkways a number of times, and he remembers that I carry a camera. I remember having a picture of Michael and the dog he once owned, his black Labrador. I think I sent you that picture, you right? Did. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, so I carry a 35 millimeter Canon camera with me, but you know, the iPhone is a great camera. There's all the cameras are fine. It, it, the camera doesn't really matter too much. What matters is then what I photograph mostly uh, nowadays for raw material. I, I need the material. And then I sit down with my computer and I work with the material, modifying it, changing it, painting it, distorting it, contorting it, turning it, uh, adding things, subtracting things to try to find things that I haven't seen before that re are remarkable. To, tr to make something that blows your breath away is extremely hard. I can make a good picture anytime, a good picture anytime. But to make something that's fantastic and magnificent and phenomenal is really, really hard. And so I work toward that. He's a photographer now, though. I mean, like you say, if you have an iPhone, you can be a photographer. And 
all those images are out there, which makes it hard for commercial photographers. There's so many images that are so easily accessible that the world of professional photography has really gone through some quantum changes. It has. It has supposedly a few billion images every single day get made and posted. Um, it's quite remarkable, but it sort of broadens the possibilities even further. Makes it more challenging By to get way, that rare, exceptional kind of photograph or image that you're talking about, though, doesn't it? It, it, well, it does. It makes it harder and harder and harder and harder. The more you see, the more you can recognize banality. The more you look, the more you can recognize what is really great and what isn't really great. There's a question. What makes a great piece of art? And it turns out there is no answer. Nobody knows the answer to that. If there was an answer, there'd be a formula and anybody could do it. But there is no answer. It's a mystery. And the fact that it's a mystery is what makes the making of art so much well, fun. Well, AI might be able to solve that question. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people are concerned and anxious about the fact that perhaps AI will be creating art and creating art that's comparable to some of the great art. It, well, AI is producing things that haven't been produced before. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see what's going on. We'll see what happens. It changes almost every day. Another question for you. This is from Adrian in Wellington, New Zealand. Thanks for the question, Adrian. Uh, Wellington, New Zealand? You have listeners in Wellington, New listeners Zealand? Listeners all over the world, uh, you betcha. Oh, God. Well, Adrian wants to know, what challenges did you encounter while photographing Cirque du Soleil? I guess he knows your work. Well, so. yeah. Well, the biggest challenge for photography, and I don't know if that if this could be applied as even a metaphor to all art, but at least for photography is access. Access. How do I get access to the dancers, to the football players, to the Folsom Street Fair, to the pregnant women? How do you get, if you're a photojournalist, how do you get access to Gaza? You know, it's, it's getting access. Now, Cirque du Soleil occurred because there's a magazine called Zinc, Z-I-N-C, I think, or maybe a K, that was a fashion magazine 10, 15 years ago. And um, I photographed a number of fashion and beauty shoots for them. I did it for me. They didn't edit my work very hard and they didn't tell me what they wanted. And so I was sort of had free reign to do what I wanted. And then I came up with the idea, how about since you're Canadian, he, the editor in chief was Canadian and Cirque du Soleil came out of Canada. Maybe you have some connections. He says, I do. I know them all. I said, how about get me in to, to the Bellagio hotel in Las Vegas for a week or two and let me photograph the whole thing and I'll submit all the pictures. He said, great idea. He arranged it. We went. So I had access through, you know, one manipulation after another, but that's sort of what it takes to, to make images that are hard to get otherwise. You also have a not-so-secret weapon, Beverly Ornstein, who helps you get access and really helps you bring the work that you have given the world into the world. Yeah, my Beverly Ornstein was the uh, head of news at KQED for many years. She's a television producer. I used to think I was really a smart person until I met my wife, who is, like, way smart. And she um, really has a feeling for all the stuff around photography. I don't know that I'd ever accomplished anything photographically other than maybe make pictures for myself if it weren't for her. And to this day, I am in a way quite crippled. I don't know how a lot of these things work. All I know is Beverly's only thing. She says, just, just make pictures to make you happy and I'll take care of the rest. So it's a, it's a good deal. Yeah, it's a great deal. And I was reading some of the reviews of your new book, Pairs. A photo book journal editor said, it'll take you out of the doldrums. I mean, I know you kind of conceived of this as more of an entertainment than perhaps a work of art, although some of your work in the past is included in it. But that idea of images actually lifting spirits and bringing you out of doldrums can happen. It can happen to the photographer, but it can also happen to those of us who are sampling and experiencing the photographs, the images. Well, well, thank you for that. The idea of the book was I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm, 
fascinated, obsessed with the relationship of two images, whether they're similar images or dissimilar images, whether they're related like a mother and child or like two dancers dancing or a couple or a double exposure or totally dissimilar. One's blue and orange and the other picture is blue and orange, but one's a flower and one's a statue. So I was very interested in the idea of diptych which of course comes from uh, altar pieces of two images uh, up on a church deus where like say uh, birth of Christ and death of Christ, that sort of things. The term diptych came from religious things. You as a scholar know diptych better than I do, but is now applied to all sorts of compare uh, comparable imagery. And so we went into our files. I was working on a project and still am on dancers, two dancers together as pairs. So I decided to go into the files and look for any pairs of images. And we came up with 200, 300,000 images. We then sat down and edited them, and then we then categorized them. And it turns out there are 20, 30 categorize, categories, categories of images. And I thought it would be a little boring to put them all together. We'll put 10 mother and child together. We'll put 10 two athletes together. We'll be 10, you know, like that. So I, we de designed the book to be an entertainment so that every page turn, there are, there are 200 spreads. So every new spread, every time you turn a page, it's a different sort of diptych, a different sort of pair, a different sort of connection between two images so that it surprises. And it, in some cases, calls upon the viewer to wonder, what's, what's he talking about? Where's pairs here? And so the book was meant to be, rather than high art, it was meant to be an entertainment. And I tell people that with 365 pictures, it's impossible to look at this thing all at once. And I, I suggest put the book out at a place you pass by every day, kitchen counter, living room, diet, coffee table, maybe the bathroom, and just look at a few spreads at a time. And that's it. And it was meant to be just a simple little entertainment. Some of your work is much more than entertainment, though. It's designed to be profound and reflective and even meditative. In fact, often your work is described as surreal, which I find fascinating in itself as a description, because makes me think of Dolly. It makes me think of uh, Salvador Dolly, that is. It makes me think of uh, the unconscious and the way we're moved into unconscious realms and so forth. You think of yourself as a surrealist? No, no. I'm just really looking for things that make me go and surprise and delight. And I mean, that is, that's the idea. And of course, then is it wonderful? So. It's a high bar. Though you you want it to surprise delight to be rare. It's exceptional. hard. I mean, yeah. I, there are there. Are, I've gone a week working on one image, without being able to find something that was special, that was exceptional. I was able to make a hundred different variations of an image that were pretty good, that were passable, that would be if you were make making a record album and ten had ten songs that would passes one of the songs, but not one of the best. So it's hard to find. Sometimes I abandon pictures. Sometimes I'll work on an image and work on an image, work on it, just I'll put it away. And then I'll, I'll take a breather and work on other things and come back to it a week or two or three or four later. I think you probably have experienced the same thing in the writing of books. You sometimes get so into it and so involved and so connected to it, you can't see it anymore. So you sort of have to put it away and open it up a week later or a month later and see it anew again. So that happens. It's, it's hard to make fantastic images and uh, it's it's a great challenge but it's still play it's still something that i could sit for hours and sit for hours and do without needing to be interrupted but you've set a tough goal for yourself just recently i believe i mean i should mention that howard Schatz has certainly photographed a lot of famous people through the years and uh most recently someone that i had the privilege of interviewing uh and that's Spike Lee, but it brought you back into this 
sense of wanting to do something rare and exceptional every week. You kind of made a pledge that you would at least try to do that, which it seems to me is a pretty high goal and a goal that, you know, you've set for yourself despite the fact that it may not come to pass one week as opposed to the week before or the week coming up. That's right. You mentioned um, my weekly journal, On Seeing, which is about creativity in art and photography. I started um, eight years ago. I wrote one a week about, been 450 journals published, and I'm done. Next week, next Tuesday is my last one, my final one. And starting in the new year, I'm starting a new one called A Photograph. It'll just be one photograph. I'll maybe caption it, won't describe much about it, but just that's it. And my challenge is, can I make an exceptional photograph once a week? And frankly, I don't know. And I mentioned in that note that if I can't, I won't publish anything. We won't post anything. So we'll see. It'll be it's an adventure. It'll see. We'll see what happens. There's Mindy from Charlotte, North Carolina, who says, how did the concept for your flower images come about? What did it take to put together? Now, is that the Botanica book or is that? Yeah. 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 Um, I have this theory about photographers making pictures of flowers. And my theory is, and of course there are exceptions and I could be all wrong, but I kind of feel that photographers begin to shoot flowers when they aren't busy with something else. They have nothing else to do. I One year, I don't know when it was, maybe 2002, 3, 4, we were not that busy. I was busy enough to do some commercial work, some editorial work, but I wasn't busy and I needed to shoot. So I came up with this idea of photographing flowers in my own way. And I did a few things. One, I contacted a bunch of nurseries and florists, and I told them, I'll share my pictures with you. Get me images. Get, get me flowers. Get me plants. Get me anything. I mean, one guy brought me a dead wasp's nest. Some guy brought me roots from some rare plant. But they brought me everything, and every week I had something new to shoot. Then I had to find a way to shoot it so that I could really delve into it. And I found evenings. I blackened my, my studio became black. It was a big 25 foot by 60 foot studio. I made it black except for the, the, where the flowers would sit and where I would light. And I played Mozart's Cassi Fantuti every night, five nights a week. And I photographed flowers and it was sort of a meditative, uh, spiritual journey. It was a lot of fun. I did everything with the flowers. I not only photographed them and lit them in different ways, I plucked them apart. I goofed around with them. I tried millions of things, I, millions of things. And anyway, there were enough images that Beverly said, you know, you've got enough images for a book here. I often respond with, no, 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 wait, I got more to do, more to do. And eventually I give in. She, she gets the images to a publisher and the book was published. That was sort of mid-career, I mean, of the... I would say we were in, we left San Francisco, or we left medicine in 95, and we were in San, We were in New York initially as a one-year sabbatical, which Beverly now says is our, we're on our 28th year sabbatical. Uh, we had so much fun that first year, we'd go to bed giggling over the adventure and the anxiety and the and the challenge and the people we met and the things we had to do was just really wonderful. I kept re-upping. But after five, six, seven years, it was just made a little lull, just for a short time. But it was an opportunity to do this other thing, which I did. Let's talk about the photographers that have had perhaps the most influence and inspiration where you're concerned. Uh, there was, a, and you know, full disclosure here, we've had a friendship for many years. And uh, I remember when you said to me one point, uh, I, I admire Annie Leibovitz so much, I'd like to be Howie Leibovitz. So you were doing a lot of portraits at the time, or imagine yourself to be Annie Leibovitz in <laughs> in male form or whatever. Um, but I know, you know you've also had a great deal of admiration for people like Ansel Adams and Imogene Cunningham, and we've talked about Avedon, who I want to ask you about how photographers maybe see faces and see 
the world around in a different way. He definitely did. He, I interviewed him many years ago, and he looked at me and he said, you're going to be just like me. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're never going to stop working. <laughs> and he, he was right <laughs> about that. So before I get to that whole question, though, about you know seeing the world differently, talk about the photographers who have had the most influence on you or who you still see as being the most inspiring. Well, um, I've been asked that question a number of times. And I uh, there are some people... Let me let me put it this way. Every day on my email, I spend a half an hour with all these emails that come in. And many of them have to do with photography, photography websites, photography, and photographers' websites. And I think it's very important to be a scholar in whatever you do. If you're a plumber, it's important to know all the things that are going on in plumbing and all the new equipment and all the new tools and all the new materials and the same thing in literature and the same thing in all kind of music and all everything. I think it's important to know what's going on in the world of your interest. So I look at everybody's website. I look and 99 out of a hundred are for people really trying to make good pictures and they're not bad. But there's one out of a hundred, maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, that I say, this is a genius. This is somebody who is making images like I've never seen before in a way like I've never seen before that's really special. And then I follow up. I usually write that person. I, I As a um, fan, you mean? Or, As yeah. a fan, I said, I looked at your work. It's terrific. I say something like, stay the course. The world needs you. I, I write that. And uh, some of them will write back and say to me, well, coming from you, that means a lot. Thank you. Or they don't write back. But it doesn't matter. What I do is file their website information and some of their pictures off into my own files. So I have them and I don't, re don't forget them. And there are hundreds of people like that. There are so many great, creative, phenomenally uh, gifted a highly gifted, imaginative, hardworking. It's really remarkable. The human genome is infinite. And what's coming out of all the different sets of genetic material coming together to produce something special like that, it's just great. So I'm influenced by everything and everybody. And I very much admire the work of really hundreds of Im uh, image makers. And do you and those other image makers, you think, see the world differently, see human faces, uh, bodies, whatever, differently than the rest of us? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, you know, there's a lot of things. One is hard work. You know, you could have a talent, but if you don't work hard at it, nothing's going to happen from it. So you really have to really work hard. Um, so, uh, but some people have an innate ability to see yeah, and have innate vision. And um, it's just one of those things. It's, you know, it's unusual, remarkable. Another question for you from Boston. Nate, thank you for the question. Did your Botanica series inspire the human flower photographs you produced? How are those images produced? Good question. Absolutely. Having spent a year with flowers, I really understand their anatomy their structure, their composition. And knowing what flowers do and how they do it and why they look the way they look and how their parts are put together, I've been able to use human bodies to make images like that. I've done it with fashion. I did it with uh, my dancers and various flower studies. I've done it a number of different ways. So yes, that has informed me, taught me, learned a lot from it. It's also interesting to me how some of our listeners have familiarized themselves with or were familiar with your work to begin with. And that's, a, I think, we owe some allegiance to Discord here. You know, we've, there, there's this platform where you can put on who the guest is going to be, and I've been doing that now the day before. So I was able to at least let people know that you were uh, going to be the guest here today. And a lot of people have been very moved by your work, uh, myself included. I mean, there's a magical and poetic quality to it. And if, for those of you who are just looking at it for, this, for the first time, you may become addicted and feel the necessity to look more 
uh, and familiarize yourself more. I hope that's the case, certainly. Um, there's also um, a sense of ideas always seem to be colliding in your head. I mean, you're giving birth to new images all the time, and that's something that has always astonished me through these three decades. Uh, like you said, it's infinite. There's, there's no... I mean, there would be some people who say, ah, I dried up, you know, I don't have what I used to have when I was younger, or I don't have the drive, or I don't have the imagination that I had, or something along those lines. It doesn't work that way with you. Well, um, I've observed this in humanity. I, uh, Sting said, the music has left me. He stopped writing music. He said, the music has left me. Bob Dylan said, who writes like that? <laughs> Referring to his own work. Uh, Picasso went on into his 90s. So we're all different. And I'm blessed with... Sting was wrong, though, because uh -huh. I interviewed Sting when he put on this musical. He put on a, a major musical, came back to him doing a musical. So he just found another form, another subgenre. There you go. Um, I'm just f lucky. I'm just hungry. I'm just really... Um, I don't know about addicted or obsessed, but um, it's my greatest pleasure. It's a phenomenal pleasure to be able to sit down with an image and screw around with it. I have on my uh, computer screen uh, something called backgrounds, and there are probably 5,000 images, maybe 10,000 images under backgrounds. There are skies. Water, flowers, landscape, rooms, um, tchotchkes, figurines. Um, uh, all, there must be 30, 40, 50 categories. And within those, there are hundreds of possibilities. And I can take an image and I can try stuff. You know, the nicest thing about creativity is you don't know how it's going to come out. Yeah. In fact, for, for photographers listening, you hear all the time pre-visualize. Pre-visualize is crippling. If you have an idea, it's one thing to have ideas, but to have a specific exact plan that you're going to go for it will restrict you, will, will shrink your ability to see what you don't even know is there and is possible. The idea is to... Go along and try things. I call, I talk about a creative tree. It's just a metaphor, but it's a simple, simple little metaphor. You, you have an idea, you climb up the tree and you see a large branch. And on the branch, there appears to be a lot of fruit to pick. And you go out on the branch. You don't know how much fruit there is or how it's going to taste. But it turns out the branch is rotten. And the branch, you go out on the branch, it cracks and you fall. But in photography, as opposed to medicine, the grass is soft. You fall soft, you go back right up the tree and look for another branch. And you keep doing that until you find a branch where there's lots of fruit to pick and it's delicious fruit. And following a plan, an idea that way, following ideas versus an exact restrictive plan is really a great is really the way to creating something that'll surprise you and that no one has seen before. Yeah, it, you mentioned Dylan before, and Dylan talks about creativity that way. I mean, it, it, it covers so many different fields of production and art and, you know, almost whatever metier might be for an individual and what they're creating. I had a question for you from David in Los Angeles, and David, thanks for this question. He says, Collaboration is a significant aspect of your work. How do you establish trust and rapport with your subjects to achieve such intimate and powerful images? Well, that was a nice question. You know, having been a physician has taught me a lot. I was a retina specialist, which meant every patient I saw was referred by an eye specialist who looked in, got anxious, uh, communicated the anxiety to the patient and said, you got to see the retina specialist. Every patient I saw came in anxious they were going to go blind. I had to learn to behave 
in such a way that within a minute, the patient would take a deep breath. I'm in the right place. I learned how to be a human being with my patients. And that really helps me with all my portrait photography, with, with, with um, unknown people, with dancers, with young people, with old people, with actors, with famous people. I know how to be a human being and to relate in such ways where I listen and truly listen and uh, show care and uh, kindness and generosity um, as really one ought to, and it is very helpful. Oh, that's wonderful. Generally, but I'm also thinking about the fact you also have to bring people out. You have to kind of nudge them and sometimes be almost a kind of uh, catalyst or salesperson, don't you? Well, no, they have to trust me. They have to see that I'm not going to make fun of them. I'm not. They could see my work. They're, I don't make pictures that make fun of anybody. They uh, have either looked at my website or uh, already know about it, I, you know, or I'm careful. For example, let's take the hardest one of all, uh, a 22-year-old woman who uh, is going to, it's going to be a nude shoot, no clothes. I mean, all right, and that already it's fraught. So generally, this is a person I've seen before, made pictures for some other reason, and on their way out the door, so that they can say anything to me, they're still walking out the door. I said, would you be interested in making a, a picture without clothes, something like this? And I'll show them examples. And if they go, oh, I said, if you feel like that, don't do it. I said, either you feel completely comfortable or don't do it. Because uh, if you do it and are uncomfortable, you can't make a good picture. But you got the advantage so, of saying I'm a doctor, right? <laughs> Well, I don't know if that's an advantage, but maybe it is. But anyway, um, I let them say anything to me, and I say, don't say yes, but if you're interested, you call me. I won't call you. So there's never any pressure or responsibility. And those pictures I've made of people without clothes have called me and said, I'd like to do that. Yeah, but I'm talking so, about just um, a, like you want to photograph somebody, you want to get them animated, you want to get them smiling, you want to get a certain kind of look on their face, uh, their physiognomy or their countenance or whatever you want to call it. And I mean, I've seen you work and you really are able to get them going in the way you want to get them going. I'm not talking about shedding their clothes. I'm just talking about, you know, being involved yeah. in the whole process of what you're creating. I, I try, I try to make it fun. I try to make it like it's fun and not too serious. And there's never any criticism and the judgment is always positive. So, I'd say it works not all the time, but almost all the time. And here's Greg from Athens, Georgia, who says, your underwater photography in H2O is visually captivating. Can you share the technical and creative challenges you face when working in such a unique and dynamic environment? Well, um, it, it, it really is challenging. For one thing, we use strobes. And if a strobe comes near a pool and drops in the pool, whoever's in the pool dies and electrocuted. So we have to learn light in such a way as the strobes can't be anywhere near the pool or you don't use strobes. Secondly, there's uh, pool chemistry. Chlorine burns the eyes and it creates all kinds of funny looks on the face. So you got to get rid of the chlorine and one can do that chemically for a day. You can get the chlorine out and then replace it when the shoot is over. Third, there's temperature. Um, people who are just in a pool not swimming if it's 85 degrees, they're going to get hypothermic and start shivering. So we've learned you got to make it about 92 degrees in the pool so that it's heaven on earth being in the water. Um, then there's all the other things, but there are all kinds of now underwater housings that make it easy to compose and focus and um, graphically design images. It's the the number of underwater pictures of images nowadays is gone. It's just thousands of thousands of pictures. So it's not that difficult, but essentially temperature, lighting, and chemistry are important, but those are all fixable. And speaking of chemistry, when you talk about the photography you've done of many really beautiful models, women without any clothes and so forth, 
I mean, I don't know if I could do that clinically, aesthetically, keep yeah. myself removed. I mean, there is yeah. some kind of a challenge there too, isn't there? Yeah, and it's changed because of the internet. People are much more uh, adverse, careful, uh, unwilling, and it's understandable because the inter the the internet has made uh, lives terribly uncomfortable and unhappy. So it's changed. It's, it's just it's just different. So you get into that whole element again of trust and making certain that you convey the importance of putting trust in you. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, I'll tell everybody a trick. Um, I'm not that interested in the sexuality of the dancers taking their clothes off. I'm more interested in their bodies, their musculoskeletal system, and the sensuality of their skin. So I've got a way around it. They wear string thongs or string tops. They wear a, 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 something that covers their breasts, and they wear strings. And they wear a thong, uh, which covers their pudendum, and a string around the waist. And in post, you can remove the string. In post-production and Photoshop, you can remove the string. But I asked permission. I said, I'm going to remove the string in post. So it's going to look like you have no clothes, although you know, nothing's going to show. How do you feel about that? Now, occasionally, dancers say, I don't want you to do that. I said, okay. So, But you did a whole book called Nude Body Nude, which was I did, entirely that was a long nude, time. Right? Yeah. That was a long time ago. <laughs> it, was, it was 25 years ago. Yeah, it was still new territory, right? I guess so. In, in, yeah. in many respects. So uh, this challenge that you put before yourself now, an image each week that's going to be rare and exceptional, you hope. How do you meet that standard? I don't know. It, it, We're going to find out. January on Tuesday or Wednesday after New Year's will be the first post of a new weekly called a photograph and so i've got the first one i feel the first one i got i don't have the second one yet but i'm working at it we'll we'll see we'll see what happens these will all be done thing. in your studio yeah yeah i all, all my work is to, beverly my dear wife built me a new studio did i have i shown it to you did i when you were here i did see it yes yeah, so I've been using it now. It's a 45 foot by 45 foot, 2,000 square foot, uh, wonderful space where I can shoot and I have all kinds of gizmos. I can try things and play things. I got, uh, it's just it's just wonderful. We've now done a half dozen shoots there and it really, really works, really works fine. Well, one thing I do want to say is and you probably know this as a creative uh, author yourself, uh, writing, uh, you know, important of important ideas that are so creative and brilliant. You can't listen to anybody because somebody's advice is their advice. It's their vision. It's their what they want. It's not you. You're the only one with your voice. You can listen to ideas, but then you have to judge them and edit them. Do they fit me? Is this something? I've had many, many friends come up with hundreds of ideas. Why don't you shoot this? Why don't you shoot that? You know what? This would be a great subject. No one has ever hit the bell because the bell is deep inside. And to do a project takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of responsibility, a lot of work. And it, you have to really want to. So if somebody's good idea doesn't fit with you, it's, it's never going to work. You can't listen to anybody. We've got to listen to your own deep inner self and go where it wants to go. But sometimes it's frustrating because you can't go where you want to go. I remember you had a project in mind about tennis uh, which is a great love of yours, uh, and actually getting the video of tennis right down to the millisecond uh, in terms yeah. of what was going on back and forth and so forth, but also doing it with some special effects and the like, that never came into fruition. No? Not all the ideas can uh, reach fruition. It just happens. There are a lot of ideas that just 
they they did they just don't go anywhere. You try your best. And, you know, there's a lot of things I want to do that because of my having not started being a serious full-time photographer until I was 55 years of age and my age now makes it makes it next to impossible. Uh, there's certain things that just will never happen. That's okay. I still have a world of possibilities around me and within me that make me happy. And, uh, I'm lucky to be able to do what I do. Do you find yourself, though, I mean, like if you're going for a walk, you're going to the corner store to buy something, whatever, suddenly you think, I should, I should photograph this. Uh, I mean, I know you carry a camera with you, but is that constantly there, like a yeah. kind of urge or a, an impulse? Yeah. yeah compulsion all the time. even? Yeah. Yeah, all the time. And, but, you know, I'd say for every, I don't know if a hundred, maybe two dozen ideas, only one then gets manifested. It's just the way it is. Come up with ideas all the time that just aren't possible, but um, there are plenty available. So I'm still, still have plenty of work to do. Lots, lots of work to do. Well, you've taken on other dimensions in your work, though. I mean, you do a lot of interviewing now. You do yeah. a, a lot of. Um, uh, I was just thinking of, for example, for a while you did Vanity Fair, and Vanity Fair, you would give actors different situations that you asked them to make faces in terms of stuff that you would just dream up, which was really imaginative and fun, I'm sure. Uh, it was a regular feature in Vanity Fair. I mean, these kinds of things are new challenges, and they're sort of always on the periphery or always there, are they? Yeah. A few things. One, the Vanity Fair had to do with my giving actors narratives. Uh, you know, you're, you're uh, home with your wife and uh, one of your best friends is a cop, rings the doorbell with your 16-year-old son in tow and says, he was out there, he's drunk, he was driving, you know, and then what do you do with your teenage son, you know, and how do you react? So I gave them all arts to play, every kind of part. And a, a few books were written. The last one was called Caught in the Act, and John Malkovich is on the cover. So I really enjoyed making those things up. And in fact, Owen Edwards, the writer, and Beverly helped me a lot with some of the narratives. The interviews really interest me. Uh, I'm really interested in people. And the great thing uh, is the amount of research you need to do prior to an interview. And the nice thing is you have the internet and all the YouTubes and all the Google videos. And uh, so like I had Spike Lee last, I'm doing a project called above and beyond portraits and video interviews of extraordinary individuals in our time. And these are individuals who have given something to humanity of meaning. And I started this project prior to the pandemic and uh, I had to stop, and recently I'm restarting it. And the great thing is, like we sent a few letters out, Spike Lee called, he said, I'm in. This is Spike, I'm in. So he came over, but we, we scheduled him for a certain day, and I spent the week before then looking at everything. I looked at everything. Now you, as the interviewer of this world, understand this better than anybody, but I... I prepared. I read everything I could read. I looked at every single interview he's ever had that was available to me. And I try to develop ideas and questions and thoughts and concepts that he hadn't been asked before. Did you see the interview or, I did with him? <laughs> I didn't even I know if it's not. available anymore. Well, it was a little fraught, but uh, that's not necessarily. I, I had not, yeah. but I thought I saw every single one that was available. But like there was one question I asked him. When you write f for your own movies, for your own narrative movies, rather than when you do documentaries, he does, you know, narrative film and he do, for which he writes the script. And then he also does documentaries. When you do your own thing, do you think of the audience or do you think of yourself? And he stopped for a few seconds. He says, I write for myself. And of course, that's the right answer for any creative person. 
You can't write with anybody else in mind if you're going to be writing something original and fantastic. So that was one question that came to mind that came from that interview. But the marvelous thing about preparing is all you learn. Preparing is really fun. It was fun looking at those interviews. It was fun reading all the things I could about him. It was fun getting to really know him as much as I possibly could. So when he showed up in the studio, I was really ready and uh, the interview flowed seamlessly. And so I really enjoy that a lot. Sometimes you, um, you do think of a specific audience, though. Uh, I used to tell students, uh, I used to quote Kurt Vonnegut, who said, write for strangers, which is not a bad thing to take under your belt. Because if you write too much for yourself, you can get clouded and you can get narcissistic and you can kind of lose your way and lose the path you're on. Uh, but if you write for strangers... It can help you maybe gear things toward a general audience that you need. Well, so that's the cost. The, the cost of being creative for yourself is the vulnerability that you have to experience putting it out there. That's the cost. That's, and that's an, it's often an expensive cost. Uh, agree. Yeah. 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 So you got all kinds of projects in the works here. What's what's doing? What's uh, cooking? Well, I'm working on the NFL thing. Now, now, I talked about access earlier. To get a football player into my studio, it's the hardest damn thing in the world. Between July and Super Bowl, they are chained by their coaches. They're not let out. You can't get any football player here. Secondly, during the offseason... Between Super Bowl and July, most of the players, not all, but most of the players live in Miami, Arizona, or L.A. And so to get them to New York, usually the response is, I'd love to do your project. Fly me to New York first class, put me up in a first class hotel for three days, and I'll be there. Well, you know, my projects aren't about... A budget. There's no money. I'm paying for everything. So well, we respond with, if you're ever in New York, please let us know. We'd love to have you. So getting accessing football players very hard. It's been a little easier to get jet, Giants and Jets because many of them do live in the New York area or New Jersey. And so I've had some, I had Darren Waller recently, a tight end for the New York Giants, a wonderful, beautiful man, 6'5", 250 pounds, who was a drug addict for 10 years and almost killed himself. And finally, through rehab and all kinds of help, turned himself around and recently signed a $50 million three-year contract because he's really quite talented. So he was in the studio for an interview. So one is the NFL. I continue to work with dance. I still, I don't want to make typical dance pictures with one beautiful soft light and a dancer in a pretty dress and a wind machine and jump up in the air. Anybody can do that. And I can teach anybody in probably 15 minutes how to make a beautiful dance picture. But I, who wants to see what's been seen before? Not me. I'm done with that. So I'm trying to make images of dance that are, haven't been seen. Dance is movement. Depth and sound. Photography is still, flat, and quiet. How do you compete with dance? It's tough. So I'm trying to find a way to show movement and so as if you can hear the sound in the images I make. You want to get I'm to the point where Yates made us aware of, you can't, where you can't tell the dancer from the dance. Well, there you go. There you go. I'm also continuing to work on this Growing Up project. I'm, con I'm restarting the Above and Beyond project. And I'm... Um, starting a project with actors, it turns out on Broadway at any time, there are usually five or 10 famous actors, Hollywood actors who love to do Broadway. They come for six weeks or three months and they do a play. And um, uh, currently in season, there are four or five wonderful actors here that we invite to the studio to make um, portraits and I'll do an interview. So we're doing that. And, that's so I, I, my plate is full. I'm so lucky. I, 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 I can't get enough. And I'm blessed to have this energy. I just want to, I tell my wife, we're, we're, we're so happily married and in love and connected. I just 
tell her and healthy. I said, I just want this to last a long time. It's not gonna, but maybe it will for a long time. We'll see. Well, I certainly hope so. And uh, what you've already given to the world uh, is so substantial and remarkable, extraordinary, really. And uh, we have a lot to be grateful for in terms of what you have given. And I'm talking about your medical career as well as your career as a photographer, two amazing oh, careers. Thank and, you, Michael. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, uh, not only as a friend, but as an interlocutor. And I want to thank all who joined us for this Gray Matter with Michael Krasny podcast episode and all of you who will be joining us in the future on Apple, Spotify, or at graymatter.show, where we cordially invite you to sign up for membership in our exciting Gray Matter with Michael Krasny community. And that's Gray with an E. Thanks, too, to this great Gray Matter with Michael Krasny team, Alex, Shannon, Colin, Chad, Kevin, Jeff, and Colleen, and to this episode's special guest, Dr. Howard Schatz. I'm Michael Krasny. Bandwidth for Gray Matter is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com.